Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Backend Bear Podcast, where we discuss anything related to programming, algorithms, and the latest practices in the coding world. So sit back, grab a drink, enjoy, and let's dig right into it. How's it going, people? Hope you're having a great start of the week. You're programming hard, and you can't wait for Friday to come in. Well, this week I got an interesting topic for you, and something that I've been dealing with a lot lately. And I want to talk about legacy, or specifically dealing with legacy code, legacy code base, and how to swim and all of that. So you're stuck. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. You've been tasked with dealing with a legacy application or a system that you had in your company for a while now. Something that was coded even before you even got to the company. We've all been there. At least once in your developer career, you have to deal with legacy code base and legacy code and some old applications. And for those who don't know, legacy code base is basically an old code base that you probably inherited or it was in the company for a long time. There are no like particular rules. It's usually referring to an older code base. It can even be a code base from last year, right? There are new technologies, new tech stacks, and it's constantly changing. And some applications get old. For example, in .NET world, you have those web pages. Then you had the Razor views. Now it's uh, integrating with Angular and so on and so forth. So there are changes that are happening and then makes your old code base obsolete. All of the points I'm making in this episode are from personal experience and something that I've been dealing with lately and help me transform the existing code base, legacy code base that I have into a more modern environment or more specifically in transforming from a Windows Forms application to a whole microservice architecture and a web app and a bunch of web applications. So don't be afraid and grab my paw and without further ado, let's dig right into it. So like I said in the intro, you're stuck. There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, right? After long talks with the management, there's probably a decision made that you need to refresh the code base and move to a new platform or a new framework or new technology and such. So what are you going to do? First of all, don't panic, right? It's something that all of us developers have to deal with sometime in the career. You can't be developing in new technologies nonstop. Every once in a while, you have to turn back and deal with something that's been programmed before. And don't despair. Be proud that the company kind of has bestowed on you such an important task. The company believes that your skills are enough to decipher what is going on in the old code base, and out of that, build a brand new solution with all the bells and whistles and new technologies and so on and so forth. What might be the reason for such a change? There can be a lot of reasons for such a change. For example, the most common one is UI changes. So you have old school views, like remember, like the old 95 web pages, right? And then you have the more modern, more dynamic, and more user involved pages that are today. That's the kind of most common practice. Rarely you change the back end technology, but that happens as well, right? There are a lot of systems even to this day that are running from with very old backends, especially banks and even healthcare. They all run on older technologies, specifically COBOL. But still, you know, every once in a while you need probably to change the backend technology as well. In my case, what I was dealing with, I had locally installed application on every client. And now we're transitioning from that solution, we're transitioning to a microservice architecture and more of a solution on the web. So moving all of the business logic and everything that goes behind, moving it to the cloud. Or the reason might be it just, it's breaking things. And it came to a point where 
just needs a change. The business rule changed, the technology changed, something changed, or it made your maintenance costs so high that it would be cheaper for you to develop a brand new solution than maintain it on the old technology stack. And you just can't throw away the entire code base. There must be something there that you can at least use and reuse. You know, there are a lot of little business rules and little intricacies that even the managers can't think of at the moment, and you might miss on them. So it's up to you to decipher what the hell is going on in the old code base so you would make a better solution. I've been with this company for two years, and the company existed for 25 years. So you can only imagine what kind of code base is there in the past 25 years. I know I learn more from the code about the business rules than from the managers themselves. So when dealing with legacy code, legacy applications, legacy code base, there are different kind of scenarios that you can come into, right? There, for example, there's the same code base, but goes into different applications. That would be my example. Like you have, let's say, for example, a locally installed WinForms application, and then you're moving it to microservice architecture, but it's written .NET. So both of them are written .NET. So we can reuse a lot of the code base from before, or you have a monolithic locally installed application, Windows Forms, and then you're, for some reason, you're moving it to a Windows service or, or a service of an operating system. There's also the situation where you have the same code base that goes into the same application, which means that you're just maintaining the same application with the old code base. And in that case, usually that's the easiest situation out of all of those because it usually involves just refactoring the code probably or changing some of the methods and stuff like that. And you don't have to go far to deal with the code base. But there's also situations where you have different programming languages. We also have some applications that are written in VB.net, so I have to move them to C Sharp. So I have to learn VB script if I didn't know it before, but I did luckily. But uh, and then you need to move it to a new language, which in my case was the C Sharp. And also, like I mentioned before, sometimes it just involves a UI refresh, right? You already have the web API set up in the background. They're pulling the same data, it just needs a new fancy. UI thing. Maybe there are small changes to the web API just to accommodate the new UI, but that's about it. The second thing that you need to think of is that the code base change cannot happen in one day. It's going to be a long process. It's probably going to take months, if not even years. In my case, probably I'm expecting at least a couple of years before the code base comes to a point where I'm kind of happy with it. Also, and the way I'm approaching with dealing with the code base, I'm approaching it through an agile workflow lens. So I'm trying also to split up all the work so developers can work on it. And it's in small chunks that each developer can deal with it, you know, from junior to the senior level. So where to start? Start with the old code base go through the entire thing don't try to get too deep into it just try to understand the big picture if it's another programming language you know start picking it up like uncle bob said you can learn a programming language in a day i mean i can throw you in in front of an assembly you'll pick it up in a day you'll it's just getting used to the syntax so object-oriented programming if you're a c-sharp you can pick up Java. If you're Java, you can pick up C Sharp. You can even pick up C++ once you get a hang of it. You know, there are a bit more features than the other two, or you have more freedom, let me put it like that, than the other two. And don't be afraid of a different programming language. Like I said, it's easy. In a couple of days, you'll pick up the syntax and you'll be going through the code in no time. And the point of it is not to write in that old language, but you need to understand it very well. Also, don't be a programming language snob. If you have that attitude, you won't make it far in the programming industry. You need to be open to different programming languages, old and new, and you always need to keep your mind open to things. 
you might learn even something from the old programming language. There are a lot of benefits of knowing an older programming language, like memory management, loop control. By loop control, I mean writing better for loops or while loops or that are more efficient, uh, don't utilize as much memory. I know in today's systems, you can get away with a lot of things. But still, writing bad for loops, for example, might bite you in the behind with time because all of that inefficiency builds up and then the entire system all of a sudden gets slowed down. And then trying to figure out the problem becomes even harder and it becomes more expensive to maintain because you're just throwing hardware at it and, you know, bigger CPU, more memory, more RAM, and so on and so forth without realizing that your code is what is causing all of that all of those expenses so you might even learn how to write more performant code out of the old code base so just keep in mind open you know you don't have to love that programming language you just need to understand it so once you successfully went through the code and kind of got a picture of what's going inside then i would draw the entire architecture out you don't have to go crazy with the UML diagrams, like to know every little box and arrow and just keep it simple, you know, squares, circles, lines, just draw the entire architecture just to give you a picture of the entire system. To me, the most beneficial thing is that visual aspect. Programming aspect is easy. Uh, once you have a clear design and where to go from that point. So if you're building a completely new solution out of the old code base, you can't put all of the features of that existing application at once. So it will take some time. Probably you would have to uh, maintain both of the applications at the same time for a while until you're confident enough in the new application that can take over all of the operations of the old one. So that's how I would personally do it. So I would have two applications running at the same time, but start small. So with the new application, start small and start building like an MVP or minimal viable product, which will give you at least some results in the shortest amount of time, which also with testing, you can use to compare with the old system. So you'll be making sure that everything's running correctly on the new system. So once you have the minimal viable product, then concentrate on small tasks or even smaller features out of that and not the entire code base, right? Try to separate it into small chunks. The smaller, the better. And by that, I mean like an example, let's say you have an application that deals with customers that are searching for some products, right? So you can split it up like search customer, search products, get customer, get product. You know, so try to atomize it as much as possible so it will be easy for the other developers to understand how to develop features of the new application. If it's a different programming language, I'm sure the company will not allow for every employee to learn that old programming language in order to develop the new stuff on it. So whenever you're defining those tasks, you need to chew up the business logic in a way that the new developer might understand. And like I said, don't be concerned of the cleanliness of the old code base. Cleaning it up will come with time. Just put that thought in your head. Don't be obsessed of cleaning it right now and then dealing with the business logic. I mean, you'll have to import some filth, quote unquote, uh, into your new code base that will help you, you know, that will get you up and running in the quickest amount of time. And then there's a refactoring and cleaning process after that. So once you figure out like what are the little pieces and bits and what is the minimal viable product or products, so it can be more than one in one system. Like I said, you know, all the old legacy code base applications can be big and chunky and especially monolithic. You have to separate a lot of things and figure out you know, what can be microservice, what cannot be microservice, and so on and so forth. So you need to have good programming uh, reading skills. So you need to be able to read the code 
and understand the code at the same time not just like oh this is a for loop no you need to understand this is a for loop because it was looping through a list of customers right and that kind of bigger picture gives you easier access to the old code base and makes it easier to understand things so once you figure out your pieces you need to devise a plan what is the best strategy to tackle that old monolithic big chunk of software that you're dealing with can the entire software be separated into chunks for example like i said before the example from before you have customers you have some kind of products you're doing a search of customers search of products so why not create first part of the application where is like just customer search dealing with the customer and then when you've done that piece then move to the next dealing with the products and then connecting those two pieces of you know of software I know it's a bit of a simple example, but I just want to give you a picture of how to kind of separate things. Or another example would be you're compiling a bunch of documents from different sources and putting them in a certain location, and then you need to package those documents into a more readable and maintainable format. So you can so you immediately see that there are like two parts of this big application so you can create a compiler where you you're going to compile all of those documents and put them in a certain location and then the still the old application would pick that up and work with it so both of the applications are still kind of working and then when you're ready you start working on the second part and then you have that second part which is like compiling those documents into something more readable and there you go you moved your existing old monolithic application to a new code base. Just try to figure out what is the best angle to start at. So you're finally ready to start dealing with the code base. No matter how bad the old legacy code base is, you need to understand what the intent of the guy who, or girl who programmed that part is. What is their intent? First of all, don't judge because that kind of frustration will get you nowhere. That person might not be around there anymore in the company. That might have been written years ago. And you just don't need the frustration. You need to keep your head cool and calm and just understand what is going on. That is your only mission. Not to judge, just to understand what the intent is and what the programmer tried to write in that piece of code. One of my favorite sayings that I always say to my developers is, no matter how bad the code is, there must be a reason. And what do I mean by that? So once you start digging through the old code base, you see something that'll make your hair on your head stand up. You need to understand what the reason is. Why did the person write in that particular way? There can be a lot of reasons why that piece of code is. One can be the business rules that you don't know or something that you don't know that kind of forces you to write in that fashion. Second of all, the programmer might have been under crunch and just made some decisions that were a bit sloppy at the time. We all do. I even do that every once in a while. I catch some of my code that's like badly written and I try to rewrite it and clean it up before anyone sees it. But you know and that doesn't happen that often usually people point, point that out to me and i clean it up right we're all human we all make mistakes out of that old code base try to use whatever you can if you can copy blocks uh, or just rewriting them the easiest way as far as upper management and the business logic you can't rely on them too much not because they're mean or anything. It's just there are a lot of things going on in the business and you know they're, they can't keep on top of everything. So you need to make sure that all of the business rules are included in your new application. And even when you're not sure, so when you read an old piece of code and figure out some business logic out of it, you can ask upper management about it. Like, hey, you know, do we calculate... I don't know, do we calculate our amounts based on frequency or based on user likability? And they will give you the answer, right? And then when you simplify the question for them, they, they'll be able to answer. But if you're expecting them to tell you everything, 
no, that's not going to happen. Never. I mean, just at least from my experience and the applications I work with, there are too many rules that you can just chew them up in a couple of sentences, right? Also, the business rules themselves might have been forcing the developer to write the code the way it is. In situations like these, communication is the key. So try to talk with everyone in the company, from the cleaning lady to the CEO. Try to ask them about some logic and business rules and what is going on inside of the app or what would help you develop better application and answer all the questions that they have and create a solution that would be in their liking. So once you figure that out, it's time to move your code base to a good repo. For example, like Git. In my company, before we used TFS, and TFS is a nightmare, especially when it comes to branching shelf set and stuff like that, so it's a bit wonky to deal with. So it's easier for me, at least my preference is Git. So if, and this comes in case if you're, if you're not building an entire new application, but you're reusing the old code base and cleaning up the old code base, I would move the entire old code base to a better repo if it wasn't there before. Because for example, on Git, it will allow me to create branches, to create tasks, to create merge, to do co code reviews of the pull request. One time I had two developers work on two different tasks on the same code base, but the tasks were related. So the way they did it was doing the same shell set and then building on top of that. And it was just messy. You have one developer that has like 20 files in the um, files that need to be committed, but it, actually the person is working on two or three files. And on the other hand, the other developer also has to keep the changes in sync. So it was, it was just messy the way they did it. Just being able to branch out things makes things way more manageable. So creating branches like development, staging, production, tests, and so on and so forth, where you can you know test out different features, make sure everything works, and so on and so forth. And now it's time to do code reviews. So developers are checking in code, checking in the new branches, Everything's working out fine. Code reviews. This is the most crucial step of your code rejuvenation. So if you're dealing with the old code base, you cannot clean the entire legacy code base, but you need to make damn sure that code that is being developed by your developers or you needs to be as clean as possible and as in sync as possible. You need to enforce code ethics and code rules very hard. And the reason for it is whenever you jump into your piece of code, you'll know right away because of the old legacy code base is dirty and not up to standards, you'll at least know when you come into a new code base and all of the new developers coming into the new code base will know how to deal with it or know how to use that as a reference. In my experiences of code reviews and cleaning up old legacy code base, I solved, uh, I know it's going to sound a bit high, but I solved 80% of my problems with the code base as soon as I got good variable names. You know, in some, for example, I, in my old legacy code base, one of the variables was named XX1 and the other XX2. And then you scroll down like three pages down and then you find where those variables were used. Once you figure them out with easy refactoring, for example, ReSharper is great with that, but with easy refactoring and changing the names, the code becomes way cleaner. At least you understand what the intent is of the old code base and that'll allow you to clean up that existing code base. So start off with variable names, update them and you'll see it'll be way cleaner. So you just need to understand what that exact variable is doing. So start simple. In my work, I go through every pull request that a developer creates, read through it. I don't go deep through it, but if the coding standards and uh, code ethics and clean code is enforced, it would make it easier for me to understand what is going on. And I don't want to go too deep into it. I just want to read it like a newspaper and understand what's going on inside. 
and then I would allow or not allow the pull request. It might seem to you that I'm bottlenecking myself because I'm reading through all of the pull requests, but if they're written nice and if they're, they're short and sweet, they're easy to read, I can go through them fast. My team is a smaller team, so I have a team of five people that I'm responsible for. So going through their code is not that hard and I can manage it you know, in an hour or two in a day and go through all of their check-ins. If it's a bigger team, you probably have more senior developers that can also do code reviews and help you out. And all three of you just need to keep in sync as far as the rules go. Some developers may not like some of the rules that you're enforcing or some ethics, but it's important to keep everything in sync. So you guys need to find, or girls, you need to find common language as far as the rules and code ethics goes that would be enforced in that particular code base. You also need to make sure that your code is testable and you need to write as many unit tests, integration tests, and data integrity tests as possible. So as, as you are developing the new solution out of the old solution, you're using those tests as well to compare it with the old system in some way because you need to make sure that you know, everything's working out correctly. The more proactive you are with the tests in the new system, the less headaches you will have on the long run, and the faster the development of the new solution would be, even though it doesn't seem like it, you're writing tests and stuff, but yeah, write tests as, as you're developing new features, but not new, but from the old features, and adding new features probably you know that's also could be a reason why there's a new revamp of the old legacy code and as the last point i would like to talk about when dealing with the old legacy code base is picking your technology stack or new technology stack so this is in a situation where you have the old legacy code base and written in an old programming language or an old technology and you need to rewrite it in a completely new technology right I'm saving this step for last because once you go through and once you split up the code and figure out all the pieces, then you pick the technology stack. The reason for it, some of the business rules might force you to write applications in a certain way that are not compliant with the latest and greatest technology. Or you wanted to write it in the older technology, but because you realized of the new business requirements that you can't write it in the old technology, then you need to switch to some other technology. And you need to catch that before anything, before even starting the development itself, because it will cost you a lot on the long run. And that would be it for today. I think I covered all the bases. If I forgot something, please let me know. You can let me know via Twitter or my email. But the point of it is, you know, start small. You can't eat an elephant in one bite. You have to eat it in chunks. Try to split up everything. Try to assess the whole old architecture of the legacy code base. Try to figure out what solution suits you best. Is it a desktop solution? Is it a web API? Or is it just a website? Or who knows? So try to figure out what is best for the architecture and the business requirements. So business requirements are important as well because that's what drives the development. When you're developing, yes, you're thinking of you know, programming stuff and how to make you know, a program to, to calculate something, but you also have to keep in mind the business rules of the application and try to see the big picture of it. And I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, like I said in the start of the episode, the, all of this is based on my experiences of what I went through and what kind of works for me now. My code base is turning out better and better. I like it more and more. And things are getting cleaner. And, you know, I learned. I learned a new programming language, I learned a new paradigm. 
it kind of opened my eyes to some of the things, right? I'm still liking C Sharp and I'm still liking .NET. I mean, VB is still .NET, but you know what I mean. I'm still preferring C Sharp to VB.NET, right? But at the end of the day, I feel like I'm a better developer now than I was before I started dealing with the legacy code even though I haven't dealt with the latest and greatest at the moment, but still, it made me appreciate what I was working on more than before. And try to draw, try to draw as much as possible. Not draw, draw like artistic pictures, but try to sketch the architecture. Like I said, just squares, circles, and lines. Simple as that, write down, try to split up the processes. And to me, that visual component helps me a lot. Thank you for listening to an episode of Back and Bear Podcast. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Back and Bear and on Facebook at Back and Bear Podcast. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to send them via Twitter or just email me at marco at backhandbear.com. Any other information or anything that you would like to know, it can be found at backhandbear.com. Thank you again, and until next time, ta-da! Ta-da!